It's a long story, which I will try to make very short in 20 minutes. It's not easy, but I will try. Uh, and uh, as you probably all of you have experienced already, we have seen quite a strong, strong development of prices lately. And we have hit outside every forecasted ranges of power prices lately. So that's a new thing in, the, in, the, in this market where we hit uh, something which is have a less probability than half a percent. That really happened. Uh, today I'm presenting Volu Insight and Volu has become a, a, the new company of ours after following this what site which I represented a couple of years ago. And uh, later on today our CEO will talk more about our new company Volu which has more than 700 employees in, in this organization. So first of all, um, Last year we had a tremendous weather effect affecting fuel and uh, emission markets. We have seen very strong development in, uh, in gas and in coal related to weather effects. First we had a very cold winter one year ago. Then we had an all-time high air conditioning season uh, over the summer, which was very hot. And especially Asia had a very strong need for coal and gas. Then we hit quite low wind speeds in Europe and partly also in Asia in, uh, in uh, the last part of the last year. And finally, we had a strong uh, COVID recovery situation in Asia, which also hit power consumption quite dramatically. So prices for, for gas went up and up over the last uh, part of, of last year. We started at a very low level uh, one year ago. And in summer, we hit like $8 in, in, the, in the LNG markets in Asia. And later on over the year, we also hit a very high level of $50 to $60 per British units in, in the LNG markets. And we are also quite high over the start of this year, which have hit the markets very strongly also in Europe. And by the way, we also see that the British gas prices follow this LNG track nearly always. But over the latest couple of months, we have also seen some periods where even higher British prices than, uh, than the LNG prices. So uh, that has sparked quite a lot of LNG cargoes, which is now heading to Europe in the coming weeks. So for China, we saw an explosion of 10% in their consumption of power last year and we saw nearly 30 percent of increase of the gas demand when we were hitting the autumn and we see that um, that prices also for coal came up quickly in asia from uh, let's say 80 dollars up to 250 dollars found a little bit way downward again but it's now up again after indonesia implemented a ban of coal exports out of their country, and that's the biggest exporter of the world. So for Europe, we saw a very, very strong uh, development in gas. The TTF curve is to the left, and it was nearly 10 doubled in, uh, on the way to, to, uh, to December and January. And the reason behind it is that we have observed very low flow of gas from Russia, is down by 20% compared to 2019. And, and also LNG cargoes hitting Europe has gone, uh, went down by 60-70% over 2021. So that's the reason behind we had this low storage level in Europe in last year, hitting these prices so extremely bad. And uh, finally, we, we also saw that uh, the EUR prices came up from 30 to 80 euros per ton over the year. So we ended up with a shorter marginal cost of uh, uh, from coming from 40, 50 euros up to 400 euros and down again after that to 200. And uh, the shorter marginal cost for coal generation came from 55 and went up and up to 140 and still like 140. So that is the candidates which give the, the two um, of peak prices and peak prices in Europe. Peak prices are often given by gas fire generation and coal fire generation is often on the off peak hours in, uh, in Europe when wind is not extremely high. So this is some, some examples. Uh, 21st of December, we had this all time high of gas, which gave this 400 euros level for the winter production of gas fire generation. 
Now it is like 200 euros for the rest of the winter for this gas fire generation and coal fire generation is for rest of winter like 140 euros. And this system is now also hitting the Nordic area, especially in the southernmost zones of Norway and Sweden, which have seen a very strong development after south of Norway had two new cable links in their operations lately. So we have now a five gigawatt connection to continental Europe out of south of Norway coming from two and a half just some years ago. But we only have 0.4 gigawatt north-south in Norway and that's the really problem nowadays which I will try to dive into now. The reservoirs are very low in Norway, south of Norway and ends up at 10% this winter probably. And uh, we also have quite low snow levels in, uh, in uh, no south of Norway, which also will continue the problem also into 2022 and 2023 probably. But we expect 2024 onwards quite normal levels again. So the value of stored water in Norway has now turned out at 140 euros, which is um, uh, what we should expect also in simulations nowadays with the quite intense situation we are into now. So the north-south connection in Norway has been reduced to 400 lately. And uh, the, also the south of Sweden to south of Norway connection has been reduced for two, from 2000 to only 400 megawatt lately. And the reason behind it is the decommissioning of Ringhouse 1 and 2, which have created tremendous problem in south of Sweden, Nesse 3. And uh, the, the west, uh, western flow, which, which have been the historical levels, has now turned into an east to west flow, which is outside range for the grid to handle. And that's why the problems are even more intense north south, both in Norway and Sweden this winter compared to previous winters. But there are some uh, grid extensions on its way, but it will come late, unfortunately, compared to the need here now. But some increase of power consumption will help a little bit over the mid 2020s. So uh, north of Sweden has come up to 55 terawatt of oversupply, which is 20 terawatt hours more than historical levels. And uh, also north of Norway has come into a very dramatic oversupply situation. So um, that's a problem uh, to get rid of now. And on top of this, we have also uh, received quite a lot of increase in the reservoir levels up in north of Norway, which is increasing the oversupply even more by eight or nine terawatt hours more. So we are in a, in a very bad need for north-south connection. And unfortunately, it will come too late by 20, mid or late 2020s. And at the same time, we also see power consumption is coming up with the new candidates for steel industry going into electrolysis of hydrogen as the main input. That will give a tremendous lift of power consumption in the northernmost south, uh, part of Sweden. And also battery production will come up in uh, nearly all the zones of uh, Nordic in, uh, in, uh, in the early 2020s, in fact. And we have a, probably a, um, a stop in the, in, the, in the wind power generation extensions here now, but it will come back again. So uh, on the supply side, we see a tremendous increase in wind power generation over the 2020s, 2030s and even 2040s. And also some solar generation and some uh, hydropower generation is forecasted to come in. However, CHP power generation is to be halved on the way uh, due to decommissioning in Sweden in Denmark and also in Finland. So now I present some forward curves for what we expect from uh, simulations. And we put here the fuel and the gas prices as they are into our model and also the, uh, the, uh, the uh, hydrological situation as it is. And we see that Germany and UK will be on top in the price curve, while south of Norway should be the third one on the list here. And then we have uh, south of Sweden, Finland and system price at the next level. And then SA1, SA2 in north of Sweden. And then finally, in the very low end of the curve, we see northern and mid part of Norway. And we see that uh, they are more and more coming together as we come into 2026, but still with quite, quite big deltas in some of the regions, uh, in particular to, to, to Germany and UK. So here are some details about the prices and we see that in south of Norway, we see that the, the high prices will be extended also into the summer, 
with 78 euros there and uh, probably we will see 100 again next winter if this hydrological situation sustains and also if the fuel and emission prices uh, follow the, the forward curves as they are. We have another scenario in case fuel and emission prices collapse totally then we will see quite much lower curves and also a full uh, harmonization at the end of the horizon here. So uh, let's say by 2027 or, or at that time, we probably will see prices connecting again to each other as they were previously to, to this new situation. However, there's, there's a lot of um, uncertainties about fuel and emission prices. And the situation now, is that uh, we have 50 LNG cargoes on its way to Europe. That will probably change the gas prices dramatically in combination with high temperatures for Central Europe over the coming 7 to 10 days and also high wind speeds in uh, continental Europe. So gas prices are also hit, probably hit by some of the, of the new uh, demand response from gas prices at the very high end of the scale. And on top of that, we will also see more LNG supply entering the market after a wave of new investments are forecasted from, uh, for instance, the United States regarding global LNG supply. So the LNG situation for, on the supply side will increase quite quickly in the mid 2020s. And we also see some long term changes in the European policies with a quicker development of renewables and hydrogen uh, supply and also more nuclear plants on its way into operation in the 2030s. But the big question here now is the situation in, uh, in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. We don't know for sure what will happen there and that is probably holding back the gas prices for, for falling quickly now. And uh, there's obviously one scenario here, which is very dramatic in case Russia uh, shut down some of the existing gas supplies. However, we don't think that's so much likely because it's, uh, they will also be, be hit by their own, uh, uh, let's say, reputation as a supplier if they really cut their, um, their demand, uh, their supply uh, for, uh, for the coming seasons. So I don't think Russia will go into that dramatic step to stop flow, which is uh, contracted already. They have stopped all kind of spot flow, but not contractual flows so far. So um, we go into a very intense season also for the summer probably. And it's not easy to forecast what will happen in the fuel and emission markets because you have this geopolitical situation as you have. And the situation, however, in Asia is improving. LNG uh, has now uh, stopped flowing into Asia because the, the storages for gas are really full there. And they also have a mild end of the winter as it looks like today. So that was the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening.